very much. And thank you all for joining me here today. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to let me prattle on at you. So who am I and why am I here? Uh, no, I'm not running for US politics. Uh, my name is Dave Lewis. I am here from Canada, although I did used to live in the area in Old Town Alexandria, and that was another lifetime ago. But in the intervening years, I have done everything from being a firewall admin to an app developer to an acting CISO, and I definitely have the scar tissue to show for it. One of the things that they never tell um, pen testers is that being on the other side of the fence is an entirely different experience, and I recommend it for anybody that does pen testing to try it out. So during those years, I had a mentor early on, actually before I ever got into information security at all. And my mentor gave me a piece of advice that was very succinct, and I carried it through, was to always have a notebook with me wherever I went. Write down everything you experienced and all the rest of it as you went. 20 years later, I had a stack of books, no word of lie, but this high. And I have them in my home office now, and I go through them, and I pull ideas out of there to write articles for the various publications that I write for, like CSO Online and Forbes. And it has been thoroughly entertaining. That takes me up to present day, where I'm in my current job. I work for Akamai Technologies as a global security advocate, which means I get to go around and talk about security at various events. Um, and it's been great because I get to talk about what it is that people really want to ha have their discussions about, the requirements, what they're really trying to fix, the problems they're actually trying to solve. And this is fun because I don't have to worry about budgets anymore. I don't have to worry about the fact that Billy stole your stapler, things to that effect. But it's really interesting, is in my world travels, pe people have a very interesting idea of what it is to be a Canadian. And when I pulled this one out in Stockholm two weeks ago, uh, it, I had to wait for the audience to compose themselves because apparently that was just off the hook for them. But it has been really an interesting time and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to be here in DC to speak, you, to, to speak with you today. I actually took this picture as I was flying in yesterday and uh, I've, no matter how many times I fly in and out of DC, I've never gotten a shot that good on my phone. But that made me think of something from about six months ago when I was giving a talk in New Orleans. As we were coming into land, I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. And a couple of ships in the water, I thought, yeah, take a picture. I had no idea what I had just stumbled onto until I looked at the picture later. And for those of you in the back row, <laughs> that's not Photoshop. That was actually a picture I dug on my phone. I couldn't believe it. But this really got me to thinking about the security issues that we see in the media today. The media loves to chew on the what is the latest and greatest. They love to beat up on whatever the event of the day is, but they don't necessarily have the facts and figures correctly. And this is one of the frustrations I have as a result. And I often find myself very much of this kind of mindset. I find time and again that I'm yelling for the sake of yelling. And go figure, working for a cloud, cloud company now, um, yeah, it kind of seemed apt. Now, when you read about these stories in the media and the various things that they're trying to cover, yes, they're trying to draw eyeballs in. So they will be a little bit sensationalistic at times, but they won't always talk about what the real problem is. They will get you to focus on, yes, there's this, but the controls are not in the right place or something to that effect. And it made me think about this and see if this works. Yes. I took my kids, with my wife and I took our kids to a, a theme park just north of Toronto for not too long ago, and this character was standing behind me, I took a picture. My son is two and a half. My son loves dinosaurs. After he saw this character, he no longer loves dinosaurs. <laughs> he was so terrified, no matter what we told him, he wouldn't believe that this wasn't actually a threat. And this is the, gets to the heart of the matter, what I worry about, is we need to talk about security from a factual, evidence-based approach. Otherwise, you get things like this, where my friend Eddie Mize created a, for a dormant cyber pathogen. Now, when you're looking at these sort of things, you have to understand that if we are not taking our time to get in front of the narrative and make sure that we are actually telling the story as security practitioners, we have to understand that eventually the auditors are going to show up, and if we have not gotten ahead of the story, they are going to take liberties with that. Yes, those are my kids. So all of this left me very much in a wanting state. I really wanted to have a, you know, a stronger discussion. So the what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to be pulling a lot of data from our platform 
uh, at Akamai, but I'm very much not a vendor pitch. I do not care to do that to anybody because I don't want to sit through it myself. Um, but that being said, here is our game plan. I'm going to briefly go through actors. Everybody has to hit that at least a little bit. Some attacks, tools, trends, data, and what you can do. And seeing as how there's a great deal of developers here, I got some ideas. Now, if we roll back the clock a few years ago, when I started into this industry, um, like a lot of years ago, uh, there were actors for hire. So when I got into this in the uh, ni middle nine, middle of the ah, English, the mid '90s, this is one of the first things I stumbled across, and I was working as a defense contractor here in the states. There were actors for hire online. I know, big shock to some of you, uh, some of you not so much. These were actors that you could hire for a price to do all manner of things. Now, this particular menu here is dated, it's about three, four years old, but it gets the point across, and I don't, yeah, uh, that's right, yeah. Sorry, font change and a new template throws me off. So, as we're going through, the, these are actually menu items on their site where you could go through, pick and choose what you wanted to do, and pay a certain amount of Bitcoin, and they would launch these attacks on your behalf. The one that got me right at the bottom was DDoS Botnet, $700. That price has come crashing down, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But all is not lost because there are folks out there that are aiming to do good things. Now, when I first put this up in my slide deck, this was a company, or not a company, an organization, I guess, for want of a better term, that was trying to crowdsource security work for various organizations. Because let's face it, most organizations do not have the best strength or the budget to be able to do these sort of things, so they would do it out piecemeal. The, and this site would actually marry up security practitioners or researchers with these folks. The problem is, is that within 48 hours of this site going live, it was compromised and all the user credentials were dumped online. <laughs> I'll give them credit, they tried. <laughs> I actually don't know if this site is still online, but it was a noble effort at least. And when you're looking at these sort of things, you have to understand what are the actors that you're having to deal with. And obviously, we have to go right out of the gate and board kids. How many people in here have tweens or teenagers? Do we have any of? OK, we got a few of those. When I was a teenager, I am very lucky that I did not have access to the internet, because I'm fairly certain I would have been incarcerated long before now. <laughs> I had a complete lack of common sense. And this is one of the problems that we found, especially when I was acting on the board of um, ISC Squared, is we found that a lot of young folks that we were talking to had these certain preconceived notions about what it was like to you know, be a hacker and all that sort of thing. But they didn't have anybody successfully guiding them on what they should and should not do. And as a result of this, they really were running on a ragged edge where they could get themselves in some serious trouble. <clears throat> and with these folks, of this age, that when you get below 18 years of old, 18 years of age, I apologize, I'm just getting over a lung infection, so I'm a little off. Um, when you get to under 18 years old, in a lot of jurisdictions, they're below the age of majority, so if they get arrested for some of these crimes, they're not going to do an extensive amount of time. So they become a disposable workforce. And as we get a little bit older, you would hope that you know teenagers have a little bit more common sense as they get older. But as we have, those of us who have them have discovered that's not always the case, because they don't always make good decisions. The problem is, is they don't realize that these good these lack of good decisions can haunt, haunt them in the future. Let me try that again. Mm. Coffee is the life. Now. Characters like this are more than happy to conscript disposable workforces. Obviously, we've seen folks like this in the news over and over again, but these chaotic actors, they do serve a purpose to a certain extent. Whether or not you agree with their cause of the day, they do serve a function. The problem is, is we have to get in front of the folks that we can get in front of, being the kids, being the teenagers, and help them understand that, yes, it's okay to do these sort of things in a controlled environment so you do not get in trouble. because. This is what can happen. They can get conscripted. And there's other types of actors out there, actors out there rather, that are more than willing to cause trouble, like getting into the uh, <clears throat> election systems. And that leads us to your standard villains and ultimately your arch villains. And there's plenty of them out there. So let's move on to the attacks. Some of the attacks that we'll talk about are volumetric, application, and protocol based attacks. And there are no shortage of the aforementioned. This is a perfect example. This slide is a little bit dated just because the current data that I have, I made an absolute mess of the slide, so I apologize for that. But it's fairly similar to this one. So what we have here is a graphical rep representation of web-based attacks over HTTP. 
the top ones that we have here, we have SQL injection, local file inclusion, and cross-site scripting. Okay, so I've always wanted to say these words. Since we're at AppSec, how long has SQL injection been on the OS top 10? Anyone? Close enough. Forever. Thank you. Wish I had prizes to give out. But this is one of the problems. Is these are solvable problems. And having a, being able to stand in front of an audience that has developers in it, this is not a case of going, oh, you guys screwed up. Uh -uh. Developers are very good at what developers are very good at. We as security practitioners have to do a better job of articulating our requirements to the developers so developers can actually do a better job of this. And these are solvable problems. These do not have to exist. They do exist in a very large portion because they are successful more often than not. And if we switch over to HTTPS, we see the attacks are roughly the same sort of breakout, <coughs> but, <coughs> pardon me, again, SQL injection is number one. And this is based on Q1 data. Q2 data is very similar to this. And this is a solvable problem. I will hammer on this repeatedly as I go through. Because there's all kinds of different types of attacks out there. No shortage of them. How many people in here have ever played the game StarCraft? <laughs> oh, come on. There's got to be more than that. All right. I just dated myself. So this is one of the ones that always struck me when I used to play the game back in the 90s. Um, was that when I wanted to describe volumetric attacks to people that are familiar with the game, when you're building up your resources in the game, you have your tanks, you have all the rest of it, and if you're a Terran, you're smoked when these guys show up. The Zerg would show up and destroy literally everything. They would just knock it all down. And this is really a great way for me to actually articulate what it's like to have a distributed denial of service attack. Because if you do not have proper protections in place, then your site can be ultimately overwhelmed. You could have the greatest site with Flash. Please, God, don't do that. No more Flash. Rip it out. Um, you can have the greatest looking site, but if nobody can get to it, this is a cons uh, an absolute problem for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when you have people throwing all manner of attacks at you, they don't just pick one attack and go. They really like to divvy it up. And as we've been studying over quarter over quarter, this tends to fluctuate depending on the time of year for whatever reason. And I think a lot of it depends on if the kids are back in school. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. But they, the attackers would like to mix it up and have different types of protocol attacks all in the same sort of suite. Now, one of the things that I have heard time and again is people say, oh, well, it's a DDoS because they're trying to exfiltrate data. This is one of the patently most insane things I've ever heard, simply because if somebody is launching a denial of service attack against your website, how are the attackers supposed to exfiltrate the data? Also, why would you exfiltrate data when everybody has eyes on glass during an attack? So can we just dispel with that myth entirely of the exfiltration? If you're going to exfiltrate data, you don't want to be seen, period. Now. When we look at the different types of attacks, we're looking at you know, infrastructure-based, we're looking at applications, and so forth. Infrastructure-based attacks, for a long time, SS <clears throat> excuse me, SSDP was a big one. The Simple Service Discovery Protocol, part of Universal Plug and Play. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. And this is something that I wrote about at one point in time. And I got a letter when I wrote about this from the Universal Plug and Play Consortium. I didn't know that this sort of thing even existed, but they were very upset with me for writing an article about SSDP being a, used as a reflector for denial of service attacks. They said it's perfectly safe. And I said, well, we have data. Obviously, those type of attacks have now dropped off precipitously, but at the time, they were number one forefront. And it was really interesting because, again, this was going back to the problem I talked about at the beginning, we're looking at, oh, this is a problem and this isn't a problem based on somebody's point of view. I prefer to do it based on data. Now, that problem has gone away, and they even asked me to take down the article, which I said no, um, just because I found that patently absurd. Now, as we look at the types of attacks that we have, we see that quarter over quarter, the attacks have been going up until last quarter, or Q2, sorry. In Q2, we did see a drop, and spoiler alert, that has recovered uh, rather significantly for Q3 of this year, and that report will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Now, the vast majority of the attacks that we see are infrastructure-based. Why? Because they're easier. You can Google attack tool, DDoS, whatever on 
Did I just say Google? You can Google it. I don't think anybody actually bings things. Um, no offense to any Microsoft folks in the room. But roughly 97 to 99%, depending on the quarter, is or sorry, infrastructure-based attacks. Application attacks are far less simply because there requires more skill level in order to facilitate these attacks. Now, when we're looking at these types of attacks and we look at the sources where they're coming from, I just realized what an eye chart that is. In, this, in Q2 of this year, the vast majority of them came from Brazil. Now, what was going on in Q2 of this year in Brazil? Olympics. Wow, did that pull up some really interesting data. Along with the Euro Cup, and we'll actually be writing more about that in our next report, it was rather phenomenal to see such a massive uptick, and we sort of correlated it with the Olympics, and it was really interesting in that regard. Now, typically what we see here when we're looking at these sort of things is it breaks out rather simply. These are the type of attacks we're seeing, very, very simple vectors. <clears throat> and when we go on beyond that, 25% of all the web attacks in Q2 of this calendar year were from Brazil. And it's really interesting when you look at it and then flip it and look at the targets. The target, quarter over quarter, is the US, number one. Always the first one to take the hit. And while most of the source attacks were coming out of Brazil in, the, in last quarter, only 9% of them were re receiving the attacks. So it was really, really interesting to watch that. Now, the eye charts are about to get worse, so I apologize for that, but this shows a breakout quarter over quarter of the type of attacks we see, SQL injection, local file inclusion, all the rest of it. And this sort of thing, when you break it out quarter over quarter, we can see who is getting hit the most. Hands down, it's retail. Why? Because attackers don't go after financial institutions anymore because by and large financial institutions are doing a better job of securing their platforms. They're doing a better job of weeding out things like SQL injection. Retail has a long, long way to go. They can put all kinds of security controls in place ahead of their applications, but if the applications are not secure, this is going to be a rather significant problem. And we're seeing those attacks rising. Now, as we see these attacks rising, one of the things that jumped out, of us, out at us, rather, uh, rather me, rather, uh, in the last year and a half, were the rise of extortion-based attacks. We've all read about these in the uh, media, and these sort of attacks we really saw come to the forefront um, about a year and a half ago. We started seeing an attack platform that they would launch an attack, and then they would say, send a, an email to the company saying, look, we've just attacked you, check your logs, this is what you're being hit with. If you don't pay up X amount, you're going to get hit again. The really funny thing was, the amount they were asking for would roughly work out to be 150, 80 to 150 US. It was really low. And we were thinking, this is, this is kind of strange. And then it really dawned on us that later on, in hindsight being what it is, we found that it was DD4BC testing their new monster. And they were doing these sort of things where they're targeting these various sites. And when we wrote about it, one of the things we noticed very quickly was they transitioned to launching campaigns in the Asia Pacific region as opposed to North American Europe. That didn't last for very long, they recovered rather quickly, and they decided that they were going to keep going. So much so that they actually started doing their own press. They would send out emails, and this is actual email that one of our customers received, obviously with bits redacted. They would say, hi, here we are, here's some news about us. If we look here, various, art, various article links, okay, great. Or just Google DD4BC. All right, they're getting a little arrogant. And now it's your turn. If you don't pay X amount, and that was 30 Bitcoin. At the time that email came out, Bitcoin was just under $1,000 per. So the price had gone up rather significantly. Now, more recently, they were going on about, you know, we could launch between 400 and 500 gigabits of traffic at your site. We found that that was actually not the case. We found it was significantly lower than that. Nothing to sneeze at for a smaller site that's not properly protected. Obviously, they would go down, but they really weren't measuring up to what they could, um, what they said they could do. <coughs> now, this didn't go well for them. Ultimately, one of their key members was pinched. This is over a year ago now. And when Europol picked this person up, they sort of dropped by the wayside for the intents and purposes. We saw less of these attacks against sites. 
They didn't go away, though. What they really did, though, is they set a precedent because they would threaten these sites. A lot of them paid up. This is the unfortunate problem, is that if you do not have your site in a good, secure shape, you don't have your applications in a secure position, you are a target just by virtue of the fact you're attached to the Internet. These folks would go after everybody. There was really no uh, discerning as anybody that would have an Internet presence. So when they set that precedent, as they moved forward, we saw stuff like the Armada Collective pop up. The Armada Collective would do the same thing, almost the exact same templated email, but the problem here was they actually wouldn't launch attacks. They would threaten, they made a significant amount of money, but the only attack they ever launched was a, that we have evidence of was an ICMP flood from one person from their home IP. Not the sharpest tax in the box. But if he had the wherewithal to talk about amplification attacks, that would probably have a little bit more skin in the game. There are all kinds of different types of amplification vectors out there, such as NTP, DNS, SNMP, things like that. God, now I want to crack my neck. <laughs> And as we go through, and uh, yet another eye chart, we look at this, and as we break out the types of DNS, NTP, things like that, and we look at quarter over quarter, hopefully I won't blind anybody over the table there, uh, it, it keeps getting larger. Why? Because it is easier for them to do. And the types of attacks, the types of reflectors that the attackers are using are things that we can fix. NTP, DNS, DNS configuration issues almost always. NTP, old daemons. Why we're not patching to current or N minus one is a real problem because we become part of the problem if we are not keeping our own house in order. Now, when we look at how these break out and the types of uh, the amounts of traffic we're seeing for these reflectors, it breaks out again. NTP is number one, but character gen. Why is that ever accessible on the internet? Why? There is no good reason. If you're going to test your printer, don't test it across the internet because there's a lot of people out there who are more than willing to help you at that point. <laughs> and of course, TFTP. Why? I don't have an answer. There's no good reason why that should ever be facing the internet. So. Why is this so easy for attackers to do these sort of things? Because there are tools out there that they can just download, click, click next, and they're off to the races. Case in point, Havage. Havage, this is an older tool, but I downloaded and set up a uh, dummy network in my office, and I tried it out, and it worked. It just worked. Um, whether or not this is still an effective tool, I don't know. I'd have to ask somebody that's been doing this longer than I have. <coughs> Excuse me. It is literally, you put in where you want to hit and launch a SQL injection attack, and boom, there you go. Now, being Canadian, we love our donuts. This one particular tool that I absolutely love simply because it's called Donut. It was this simple. You put in the URL of the site you want to hit and go. That's how easy it is to launch a get flood against the site. It just boggles the mind. Now, when you look at the type of traffic that you would see coming at your site, it's really not distinguishable from regular web traffic, except for the fact there are literally millions of these coming at you. So for an attacker, or somebody that wants to be an attacker, and I deliberately use that term, it is really simple for them to download these tools and go to town. Now we take that and move a little bit further. I always include this one. Why? Because it amuses me to no end. Hulk stands for the HTTP Unbearable Load King. Great. Again, another get flutter, and this would launch, um, this is the type of traffic you would see. Again, really not distinguishable from any sort of regular web traffic other than the fact that there are so many hits. <coughs> now, we go back to talk about the hacktivists earlier. The hacktivists love to employ the disposable workforces. Those disposable workforces are looking for something to belong to. They're looking for a cause. They're looking for a reason to be. So, Enter low orbit ion cannon. This is an older tool, but this is something that was crowdsourced. The hacktivist took this tool, created it, gave it out to folks, and gave instructions through various formats, through IRC channels, through pastebins, and things like that, on what the target was when they were going to attack. People gleefully jumped on this one and launched attacks. Problem was, is this tool did absolutely nothing to obfuscate the attacker. 
So a lot of people got in a lot of trouble because they were using this tool. Why? Because they didn't have the wherewithal to sit down and go, wait a minute, is this a good idea? Should I be doing this? So we see there's a lot of configuration options here. So why don't we make it a little bit simpler? Enter the high orbit ion cannon. This was another one where they could, the attackers could literally click the button and go. You put in the target, that was it. And it was such that in the event that the attack could be stopped by the target, they could lo lo sorry, load up uh, blaster packs, I believe they were calling them, uh, where they would change the attack and literally make it as simple as possible for the attacker. Again, disposable workforces were being put to work and getting themselves in some serious trouble. And we move forward, we see things like this where we see the Brobot. Brobot was a platform that was ostensibly being run by a group based in Iran. Now, this group would launch attacks against financial institutions across the United States. We found out very quickly that they didn't do geography because they would attack Canadian sites as well. And really, they actually, we did find evidence of this that they actually thought we were all part of the same country. And being Canadian, it was a little bit, hey, hold on, time out. Um, so this was a platform that was based heavily on compromised WordPress install installations. And it was a very adaptable, strong platform. They could pivot an attack within five minutes. So if you blocked what they were doing, literally five minutes later, they could pivot the entire platform. It was extremely effective. The interesting thing about this particular tool is that as soon as we saw a cha regime change in Iran when Ahmadinejad was no longer in power, we didn't see attacks from these guys anymore. They just sort of stopped. The funny thing is, the platform is still out there. So somebody has the keys. Now, heaven forbid somebody would take a platform like that and make it worse. SSH down, showdown. <sighs> Our researchers, are, they kill me. Um, they found this worm that was out there that was going around compromising IoT devices. And then they would actually use these to proxy traffic as a reflector. Oh, have you heard about Mirai? This is a botnet that was built out of all kinds of uh, cameras, uh, CCTV, all like all kinds of devices, IoT devices. Now, the really interesting thing about this is that the passwords that they were using, and I apologize if that gray doesn't show up, were default passwords on these devices. Thousands and thousands of these devices were compromised because they had default credentials on them. This is something that app developers can work on to make sure that that's not the case. So that when you install the device, you have a password when you log in, but you have to change it immediately. This is really not that difficult to do. Unfortunately, with IoT devices, we look at the gold rush that is out there. Everybody wants to get their device out the door. You see devices being shipped with deprecated libraries, with default credentials. And now we see the very real problem of this particular botnet could launch a terabit of attack traffic raw attack drive, not even reflected. This is going to get worse. All right, now we look at those actual tools and then we look at stuff like WGET. This is where I get a little bit crazy when you talk about law enforcement and government types talking about attack tools. And they say something like this, WGET actually showed up in the media about a year ago where government types were saying this is an attack tool and we have to ban it. This is why I like yelling at clouds. These are not the thing. If I have a hammer, I can build you a house or I can bash you about the head and neck. It's not the, it's not the hammer, it's the intent. And this is one of the things that really bothers me when people try to ban security related tools. And as we're going through this, we look at all of the data that we've collected from our platform, we're able to see some very interesting trends. <coughs> One of the ones that I absolutely can never get a, enough of is the media grandstanding. We have attacker groups like Lizard Squad, who I always love to beat up on, where they would attack sites and they would happily talk to the press. If you're committing a criminal act, running to the press is probably not the first best option. Just a thought. But one of the things that they have brought to light is the commoditization of distributed denial of service. This is the part that really struck me, is this has been around for a while where we see SaaS-based offerings for attack platforms. But folks like Lizard Squad did a lot by being in front of the media to bring this more to the forefront. And these platforms are built, again, on a lot of types of devices, like home routers that are easily compromised. And now with the stuff like the Mirai botnet and the source code is now freely available online, 
I can see this going very badly very quickly, especially if all of these are now ultimately moved into one of these platforms. So they launched their platform based on source code that they had taken from another group called Titanium Stressor. When they launched their platform, apparently they didn't know how to do HT access files, so it was very simple to actually navigate through their site and also pull all of their users out. They fixed that ultimately, but the thing that really got me when I was looking at the platform was this. This is just a sampling of the offers that are available. So here we have here 7,200 seconds per month for $69.99. Being a coffee fan, this immediately struck me. When you look at a Starbucks for $2.55 per day, if you're having one cup a day, <laughs> um, an Americano, it costs you $2.55. That package would cost you $2.33 based on a 30-day 30, 30 month. For less than a cup of coffee a day, you can be launching denial of service attacks. So when we look back to the earlier slide where you could hire a DD, uh, DDoS botnet for $700, now for less than a cup of coffee a day, and that is just in a couple of short years. So these platforms, they have various types of nomenclature that they like to refer to. One of them is a booter. And a booter, this is a type of thing that was born out of uh, online games, where somebody would be able to knock somebody off a gaming platform, <coughs> excuse me, and because they would get upset because somebody got a higher score in Destiny or whatever it happened to be, and they found out rather quickly that when they knocked that person off, they could take out multiple others. And this was basically a whoops factor of 10. And then the nomenclature shifted a little bit when we look at it from the perspective of a stressor. Now, a stressor is actually a legal artifact. They are using this very purposefully. Uh, back in the 90s, when I worked for a financial institution, we did have a third-party service that we used that would send junk data at our site to see how our site would stand up. So there is a history here where they actually do have some sort of precedent. Now, with, the, with that, it's a bit of a weak precedent because they are very much dancing in a dark spot here um, because they're saying, oh, we built the platform, how you use it is up to you when the only thing you can do with the platform is launch an attack. A little bit weak. So there's all kinds of stressors and booters out there. Here's a sampling of some of them out there. The one at the bottom is the one that really stuck out to me, the Big Bang Booter. Apparently, from folks that I've talked to, this is an absolutely terrible platform, but they have Excellent marketing. <laughs> Found this on YouTube. I love this video. So it takes a, about a minute to get where I want it to go, so I'll just blather on. <clears throat> they have really wrapped their head around the idea that they are actually a service, that they are providing a business acumen of some description. Now, they claim that they have their own custom source code. Everybody claims that. Uh, with the lizard, net, lizard stressor, we found out very quickly that it was not their own code. And, you know, so build you up, you want to hit like a boss. Okay, great, fine. They've got a boot page, so does everybody else. Fantastic. Here we go. All right, so they have untraceable servers. Mm, that doesn't work on the internet. Eight different types of attacks. Okay, variety. Uh, nope. And 24 by 7 friendly support. <laughs> this is how crazy this has gotten. And the funny thing is, there is actual precedent from this from back in the 90s with load testing sites that would launch against your site. So it's really interesting because think about it this way. Bug bounties today. Ten years ago, did anybody think that this would be a thing, realistically? No. I mean, sure, there's outliers, of course. But anyway, so some of the other highlights that we've seen through our data is all manner of SaaS-based platforms. People are trying very hard and diligently <coughs> to not die um, to compromise these platforms in order to make their botnets bigger. Looking at all kinds of SQL injection and data breaches that are fueling login attacks. <coughs> Pardon me. So the thing that really bothers me about this is that we see these data breaches, and people have a bad habit of reusing the same username and password on multiple sites. Why? Because most people don't have the wherewithal to sit down and remember all of these username and passwords. In my own password vault, I have over 500 usernames and passwords. This is nuts, but it works, because I have to just remember the one password. So, 
this is where it gets a little bit upsetting when you see data breach notices that are going out that say, well, if you use this password and uh, username and password on another site, be sure to change it there too. It's like, no, no, you should really be articulating to folks that they should not be using the same thing over and over again because it becomes part of the problem. If you're logging in to hellokitty.com or whatever with username and password that is the same as your internet banking site, one gets popped and they end up draining your bank account, this is a real problem. So this is where we have to do a better job of educating our end users. Now, when it comes to education, we also have to look at it from the fact of attribution. The media loves to jump up and down about, it was this country, it was that country. Okay, great. What we don't do at our company is do that. We will do raw data. We will not say it was country X or Y. Why? Because that's somebody else's fight to have. <coughs> but that being said, when we look at the, uh, look at the uh, traffic that we're seeing, in Q2 of this year, 56% of all the DDoS attacks originated from our favorite company, to, country to beat up on, China. That is a lot of traffic. Either they have a lot of open relays or they have a lot of people that are very interested in causing trouble. And we look at the types of DDoS frequencies as they go across from industry to industry. This is a little bit of an older slide, but it still is true today, is the vast majority of attacks are going after gaming. <coughs> Why? Because this is where most of the attackers are going after, because the, especially around Christmas time, when they get their new game set or they get their new game or whatever it happens to be and they get very irritated because somebody knocked them off because they did a better or got a better score, and that jumps way up. And there is a lot of money to be had in gaming. When you look at the various type of gaming companies out there and how much money they can net from a single title, wow, it's amazing. And when you're looking at things that are really big, <coughs> this is a perfect example of one denial of service attack that we stopped. And this is how simple it was. This was the packet, the actual raw packet that was hitting us. Um, our customer, when they got in on Monday morning, were surprised to see these frantic emails from us saying, you're under attack, because their site never went down, but they were getting all of this. That was about a 300 gig attack. That was crazy. And that's all it was, just junk data being thrown over and over again. Now, when we look at this sort of traffic and look at how much of it is out there, we can plot it out. This is an IQR graph that we plotted out. Now, you're going from, I'm thinking, I have to look at the screen, my apologies. So from Q2 of 2014 to Q2 of this year, each one of those plots represents an attack. And the higher up in the stack they are, the more volume. As you progress across to today, over here, it's not that much of a stretch to think that'll be a solid black line in a couple of years. Attacks are becoming more and more frequent. So as we go through this and we look at why are all these attacks, like one of the things is like SQL injection. People are going after these sites. Why? Because it works. This is something that we can solve. We look at the various things right down to Java. Java is the most maligned remote access platform I've ever seen. People love to beat it up. But SQL injection, I keep hammering on this, this is a solvable problem. If we can take this and go beyond this room and work on our applications to remove this and make sure that SQL injection doesn't have to be on the OWASP top 10 anymore, that would be fantastic. That one thing could be possible. Because when these attacks happen, bad things happen. Perfect example, this is from uh, Tony Hunt's, uh, is it Tony or Troy? Troy Hunt, sorry. Troy Hunt's site, this is a fantastic site, where he actually keeps track of all these uh, different types of data breaches. The numbers there are staggering. We have hundreds of millions of usernames and passwords that are being compromised. And then when you think back to it, of having these replays, how many of those are actually going and logging into various retail sites, getting gift cards, things like that? There's a lot of money to be made for the attacker. And then when we look at how much of a problem this is, we look at these different data breaches. This is from a year ago. I redid this slide about uh, two weeks ago. This is from a site called Information is Beautiful. If you go check it out, I recommend it. It is fantastic for data visualization. Um, I actually have no idea who runs it. But this is their InfoSec data breaches. This is nuts. And the attackers love to find these username and passwords, and they'll find them all over Pastebin, all over Ghostbin, all over these different sites. And then they'll take them, and they will dump them into these tools which doesn't show up very well on there, but what they do is they have these tools where they'll put them in and they'll click go and they will run them against other sites. This is how easy it is for them. 
They can, they, the attackers really have weaponized this. And this is possible because of SQL injection and other types of breaches. Those are not all solely uh, SQL injection issues, but a good share of them, I'm sure, were. And we have to understand that we have to do a better job of making sure that the hygiene of our systems, the hygiene of our applications is such that we don't have to wonder when we read about a company being compromised, oh, would that affect us too? I want to be able to say, no, we're fine because of X. Now, this is a perfect example. This is a rev slider. Anybody ever gone to a WordPress site where they have the images scrolling across the screen? Yeah, there you go. Uh, it, very visually appealing and that sort of thing. At one point, the, the WordPress plugin, the RevSlider, had a SQL injection problem. They fixed it as soon as it was, they were made, atten made aware of it, and that was great. But the problem was not so much with RevSlider, but the fact of why these sort of things are available. So malicious uploads are a great example of this. When we look at this and we look at the CVE numbers for things like where we're seeing these uploads of shells, 2009, 2012, 2008. This is a slide that I created at the end of 2015. All of these CVEs have been around for several years. Why? Because people were not fixing their stuff. And this is really a problem. Because if we do not fix our applications, if we do not fix our infrastructure, we really run the risk of becoming part of that undead army that's out there that is being conscripted to attack various sites. Sure, the Mirai botnet was huge, it was monstrous. They burned it on a journalist. They really did, they wasted their opportunity. They had an opportunity to have an absolute crushing blow against, who knows? They wasted on a journalist because they got mad. Imagine if it was a mature organization building that botnet. A little bit scary. So what can you do? There are various things out there. Ignore the first line. I forgot to remove that one. Um, SQL injection. Ah, I'm back there again. Solvable problem. Harden your systems. Make sure you're doing code reviews. With your ISPs that are upstream from you, work with them. They may have a, a strategy to help mitigate attacks. You want to make sure that you're doing all of these various things, but I'll get right down to it. And Chris and I had this rant out in the hallway before my talk. Patch your systems. This is, nobody likes to do it. Nobody likes to do log review. These are essential things that we have to do. And I don't know why this is still a conversation that has to be had in 2016. Now, when you hear about attacks in the media, and you hear about all these sort of things, you want to go through it and realize you have to look at the data, because the data may very much paint a different picture than what you're seeing. And this is the kind of thing that you have to keep in, keep in mind. So all of the stuff that I was talking about today is available at stateoftheinternet.com, which apparently now redirects to a part of our site. Um, but we do uh, publish all of our research and things like that. It's freely available. And none of this would be possible without our security team of researchers at Akamai. And I really appreciate their input to this particular presentation. That being said, I would like to thank AppSec, uh, OWASP, for having me here. I greatly appreciate that, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I greatly appreciate it. Any questions? Oh, we got one there. Oh, he's got a mic, actually. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, you mentioned a lot about uh, SQL injection attacks. Yep. Right? So from your vantage point, do you have any idea about how, how you know what percentage of these SQL injection attacks are successful? <laughs> Greater than zero. Um, the actual number. Of, well, see, on our platform, this is where it gets a little bit sticky because our data is attacks that we were stopping. Right. So we don't see. Um, there's no successful ones on our platform. But yes, I do know that they are successful out there. This is one of the problems is we have to correlate data with multiple sources. And ultimately, that would be a great project if we could get that off the ground to actually figure that out. But it is a significant number. And just by virtue of the fact that they are attacking based on that so often and so much, it really lends to the uh, theory that, yes, it is a successful attack vector to, the, to this day. I hope that helps. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.